Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Okay, guys, well, we get to talk about an awesome um, topic, prayer. And I, I think, you know, in the American churches, American Christianity is probably one of the least, I mean, it's, a, it's something we frequently don't take advantage of. I think a lot of it has to do with we're such a rich nation that I think we, and we become so independent, or at least we think we're independent, that we don't rely that much on the Lord. And, and in truth, you know, it's an opportunity to draw close to God and because uh, he wants to draw close to us. And so um, I want you to think back. Now, prayer is just basically talking to God. Say, hey, God, can you help me out here? And it can be big things. It can be small things. So to start off with, I want you to think back the last time you had a big crisis that you needed the Lord to come through on. Uh, maybe, it was, maybe it was a financial hardship. Uh, you had your back against the wall. Maybe it was personal illness. Maybe it was a, a death in the family. I want you to think back on that, and, and um, one of the first things that comes to mind, I think, was I think of our, our, our statewide day of prayer recently, last month, when we had that ballistic missile threat. Anybody, uh, anybody remember that? Like it was yesterday? Um, and for, for us, it was about 40 minutes of, uh-oh, the end of the world as we know it is upon us. So um, we, uh, for, my, for my, uh, my new boy, John and my wife and I, we, we huddled and we prayed. And, you know, I remember having this piece like, I don't care about whether I make it, but he is just starting off, Lord. Could you, could you spare him? And fortunately, though it said this is not a drill, remember that? Not a drill, uh, just a mistake. But uh, thank goodness that it was. You know, we can, be, we can say that. And, um, but when we, when we pray to God, you know, his there's basically three responses that you're going to get back from him. One is, nope, not going to give it to you. Second, yep. And third is, mm, you're going to have to wait for it. And so let me give you an example of, of, uh, of the first. So last Sunday was Super Bowl Sunday, and I told you um, I was praying that the Patriots would win. Now, I, I've, I've liked the Patriots for a long time. They're not my... my you know, I, I like the Oakland Raiders, and um, there's not much to cheer about these days. So, I, uh, but I like the Patriots. They're a great team, and they're a dynasty team. And they've got one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time. That wasn't why I was praying for him, though. If you were if you were here last week, I mentioned this guy um, uh, Bernard Reedy. You probably may not have heard of him unless you saw the article that I did by uh, uh, ESPN that talked about this guy who he's played in the NFL for four seasons. He has been cut six times from teams, and, uh, and he, he um, just made the roster, I think he, this 57-man roster, just near the end of the season, and so this, this guy is going to get to play in the Super Bowl. And um, he's five foot eight, about kind of towards my size, so kind of short for the NFL, and so, but he got, he's gonna, he, got a, you know, he got to play in the Super Bowl. And I was praying for him to win because in the article, he gave credit and glory to God. He said, he said I read my Bible, and that's, that's changed my life. And, and God blessed him with letting him be in the, play in the Super Bowl. But God, when I prayed that prayer, God said, no, we're going to let the Eagles win. And I don't know if you watched the game afterwards, but uh, Nick Foles, is the, he's the um, quarterback, now, he wasn't even going to be in the Super Bowl. I mean, he was, he, uh, was two years ago, he wasn't even going to play in the NFL anymore. He was, things weren't going very well for him. And, and, after, and he said, I prayed, and the Lord said, keep playing. Now, he was behind Carson Worse, right? Carson Wirth, Wentz, Wentz, uh, who is the, he was like the, the quarterback to take him to the Super Bowl. Only he got injured, and he's out for the season. So this backup guy, Nick Foles, comes in and, and not only gets them to the playoffs, but they win against a top quarterback. And afterwards, he gave glory to God. He said, he's, he said, you want to give credit to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and thank God. And it, I don't know if you caught it too, but the coach, Doug Peterson, also gave glory to God. And so even though I wanted this guy, uh, 
uh, Reedy to, to, to win and to get a Super Bowl win, because I didn't mention this uh, in, uh, last week, but you know what? This guy, this guy that uh, plays for the Patriots, this wide receiver, what he did uh, on his off time was make $11 an hour wheelchairing, taking people in wheelchairs around to places uh, it, from in his, home, in his hometown. And I, you know, that's, a, that's an awesome thing. And not only that, he gave glory to God, but God had a bigger picture. He's like, my name is going to be praised. So after the Super Bowl, everybody watching, these guys are, are you know, giving glory to God for that, for that victory. And that's awesome. So that's an example of prayer not getting answered. And then we have the answered prayer of yes. Is Louis here today? Is Louis here? So we've got little Louis here. Louis's a little dog if you can't see him. Um, and little Louis was an answer to prayer because um, I don't even want to mention the word thunder. He gets freaked out by thunder. And it was been about probably about three years ago now, huh? Louis got spooked with a thunderstorm and ran. And Louis lives really close to a very busy road. And... Uh, not to be morbid, but there are a lot of dead animals that I see along that road. And little Louie was freaked out of his mind running loose with, with the thunder. And, and we all prayed, if you were here, we were all praying for him that Saturday night. And, um, and I remember Phaedra, Phaedra was so freaked out she couldn't even talk. Louie is like her kid, and her furry kid. And uh, I've got furry kids of my own, but... Um, we prayed, and, and Phaedra didn't know the Lord at that time, and God used that answer to prayer, and you can see he obviously made it fine, but for a while, and we would just been talking on our car ride to work, we'd been uh, talking about Job and the suffering that Job went through, uh, and, and, and how the Lord came through in the end, right, and, and so little Louie, sh she said, this is, my, this is my Job, this is my test, but the Lord answered that prayer, and he's here today. And, and then sometimes, the, well, I actually, you know, when I look back at some of the big things in the last year that I've dealt with, um, I've had two friends and my dad end up at the Kona Hospital in the ICU on, on a respirator, sedated on a respirator. I've never been in ICU before, and all of a sudden now it's like it's my frequent flyer place. And so I've, been pr I've prayed a lot for my two friends and my dad, and I actually just ran into the, one of the nurses uh, on Friday, and she said, uh, how's your dad? A as in, I didn't think he was going to make it. In fact, she said, I didn't know at first he was your dad, and I was like, oh my God, this is bad. And then when I found out it was your dad, it was like double bad. Uh, and, he, and he made it. And so did my two friends. They made it. And uh, so that was that was. That was answered prayer that said, yes, I'm granting you what you want. And one of the things that, I would, that I've learned is that the more you pray for others, the better chance you have of your prayer being answered yes. I don't know if you've, if you've experienced this before. The more I pray for myself, the less common, not that I it never get what I want, but you know, like a spoiled brat sometimes, we can be like that, right, with our heavenly dad. It's like, give me, give me, give me. And sometimes the Lord says, hmm. Just like, a, just like an earthly father, there are times where, you know, our kids want something that we know it's not good for them, and we've got a bigger plan. That's what we're talking about with, with them. And so, um, and then there's the, um, the, what I mentioned already, there's the, uh, you pray for something, and, and you kind of don't get an answer, and then he's like, okay, now I'll give it to you. So my example for that is my son, John. Now, I actually pr started praying for my uh, would-be eventual wife and my would-be hopefully someday family when I was in high school. So uh, it would be uh, more than 10 years of, of after that prayer before I would get married. And then the Lord said, mm, we're not climbing a steep enough hill yet, so I'm not giving you kids until you celebrate your 20th wedding anniversary. Now is the time for you to have a kid. And so... Um, uh, praise God for answered prayer, uh, even if it's eventual, uh, that now my, my boy just, just turned three months old, and this is his coming out party today. So um, I'm thrilled that you all could be a part of that, and um, I'm sorry that you can't touch him yet. It's just, it's just the protective daddy in me is all, so forgive me. Um, 
And we're going to talk about forgiveness today, so you can just forgive me on that. Um, and I don't know if you've ever had this happen, but have you ever asked God for something and he, like, did way more than you asked for? My parents came over about, oh, it's about three years now, uh, for their 50th wedding anniversary. And we were actually out in that water. And I've been out, I've lived here for about 20 years. I've been out on the water quite a, quite a few times. And um, you don't want to take me along if you're trying to catch fish. It seems to be that that's never going to happen. So at least it didn't with the times that I've been out on the, on the water. And so, but I remember I was at the back of the boat, and it's like my, you know, this is the week, the week of my, my parents' 50th wedding anniversary. I'm like, Lord, can you just bless us with fish today? And, um, and the, the captain of the, sh of the ship was actually kind of annoyed because we, we arrived late at the boat, and he's all about the fish. I don't know if you know any fishermen like this, but they're all about the fish. And so we were going to fish for ahi, I think it was, and we, we had the, they, got the, they got the high-tech stuff, right, that they could kind of track where they're at, and we didn't catch anything. And so, uh, so, we're, and, and so then we start fishing for these little fish called kava kavas. I say, small, I say small fish, but to me they were big because they were way bigger than the, than the uh, bluegills that I used to fish for in the little creek by my house. And so these kava kavas are maybe like this big. And I, I was a little prideful, I admit. I was, my, we had two poles and my wife was on one, I was on the other. I was like, mm, can't help but notice I'm catching more fish than you. Well, I mean, we were having fun, right? We, I asked for a fish, we got fish, except Shortly after that, while we were still fishing for the kava kava, a big marlin jumps out, actually closer to another boat than our boat. So I was like, oh, that's cool. Well, that was, it was on our line. And so uh, my wife gets into the chair. I don't know if you've ever fished for marlin before, but they got this swivel chair. So you can, like, move because they, I, I would later find out, you actually only catch about one out of three marlins that you actually get on the line is they'll snap it. And then there's the, so you have to pivot, and then you actually, you, the line is set so that uh, you have to wear them out. You're not going to, they'll snap the line if you're not careful, so you have to kind of tire them out. So my poor wife is like 45 minutes really in this fish. 332 pounds, I think she won the prize for biggest fish of the day. And that was an example of the Lord going, all I asked was for fish, but the Lord blessed us with 332 pound marlin, which by the way is pretty good barbecued. Uh, and so, um, so today we're going to be in uh, Matthew 6. These are going to be the words of Jesus. And we're going we're gonna to spend a little time in James chapter 5. And we're also going to be in 1 Kings 16 to 18. And what I want to do is, um, uh, let's go ahead and, and um, one of the things, Jesus is our best example of prayer, right? And I don't know if you knew this, but Jesus actually spent an entire night praying before he picked his 12 disciples. Anybody think that he should have prayed longer? I mean, you know, some of these guys are up in stained glass, but if you read about them in this book, uh, they were pretty flawed. I mean, Jesus picked four fishermen, um, kind of typically fishermen are a little gruff. Uh, I'm not sure if they're the best representative for, for getting the gospel out. He picked a tax collector who actually wrote the book that we're going to look at here, Matthew. Um, he picked Judas, knowing that Jesus, Judas would betray him. Anybody ever, anybody ever pick somebody knowing that they would stab you in the back? Um, you can argue that he didn't make a good, good pick. But that's where, and in fact, before Jesus goes to the cross, before he's resurrected, these guys are a bunch of bumbling kind of idiots. I mean, they do good things, but they aren't actually, um, th you know, Jesus tells them that, they're go that he's going to die, and they say, well, who's, I'm going to be the one in charge then, right? They're arguing who's going to be the greatest now that he's, he's heading out. So, but that's actually good, because then when you look at what happens when Jesus gets raised from the dead, they are changed. And if you want proof of the resurrection, you can look at that. You can also look at, James, when we're going to get to James, James is actually the brother, stepbrother of Jesus. Who would want to grow up with Jesus as your brother? It's like, I'm, I, why does I have to have the perfect brother? And you remember, Jesus was without sin. That's kind of a rough go, don't you think? I remember they had the same mom, Mary, but they had different dads, right? The Holy Spirit for Jesus and, and uh, 
uh, Joseph for Jesus' father, or uh, legal father for Jesus, real dad for James, and actually Jude. Those two books of the, of the New Testament are written by Jesus' brother. And I don't know if you've, if you've read through the gospel accounts before, you'll notice that the brothers are not that excited about Jesus. They don't believe he's the, he's the son of God. They don't believe he's the savior of the world. They mock him. After he raised from the dead, though, and that if you want proof, look at the changed lives of the disciples after Jesus is raised from the dead. Look at his brothers. That's when you see these guys went, holy smokes, this is the real deal. I didn't believe it before, but I saw it with my own eyes. I believe it now. All right. So Jesus spends the whole day, the whole, day the whole night in prayer. And, he, and you'll see throughout, he's always praying. And he's, um, we're good. so Matthew 6 we're actually going to, this is going to be the Lord's Prayer that we're going to read. We're going to move a, a little before that and a, a little bit after that as well. And these are the words of Jesus. He says, when you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go to your inner room Close your door and pray to the Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose they will be heard by their many words. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Before we get to the, the Lord's Prayer, let's just look at that for a minute. So he's not saying that you have to always do prayer in private. He's saying that you want to pray pray to him like you're just praying to him and not making a show for men. If, you pray and, if you're praying as a show to men, and God knows your heart, by the way, if you're, praying to, if you're praying just for show, you've got your glory right there. That's all you get. But if you pray to him with your heart, whether in secret or in public, okay, now your relationship is valid. Now he's, now he's hearing what you've got to say. Um, and, and because he knows, isn't that kind of a good thing that he knows what you need? Now, you'll notice it didn't say what you want. Now, I know many times I know what I want, and I asked for what I wanted, but I didn't get it because the Lord says, no, that's, I love you too much to let that happen. There's going to be problems if I let that happen, right? So, um, so you, he knows what you need, so you just got to open up to him and be honest. You know, don't snow him. You can't anyway, so you might as well just talk to him, tell him what you think, and see what he does with it. Now, it's often called the Lord's Prayer, and, and there's actually a, the sister passage in Luke uh, chapter 11, 1 to 4, but it's actually just a model of prayer. It's not the only way to pray, it's, it, but it does have some important things in it. Um, and well, let me read, read, read here. Pray then in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed or high and lifted up be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our, tre our debts or sins as we forgive those who trespass against us or sin against us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'm going to carry on just a little bit and then we'll come back. For if you forgive others their transgressions or your sin, their sins, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But... If you do not forgive others, your Father will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. Okay, well, this is a pretty loaded prayer if you didn't notice already. Um, number one, it's, it's, um, it's conditional, right? It's like, um, one, you got to go to him every day. It doesn't say you get to ask for your weekly or yearly or your 10-year bread. He's like, you got to come every day. Why do you think that is? I think it's because he wants us to talk to him every day. He's like, and in fact, you know, when the Israelites were tramping through the desert, they got food how often? Every day. Where was it? On the ground. Had their graham crackers right on the ground. They'd eat every morning, except for on the, the day before the Sabbath, the day of rest, they would get a double portion. Well, that's, that's, that was a symbolic of what we're supposed to do on, on this earth, us. We're supposed to look to him, ask him for our provisions every single day. He doesn't get tired of it. He doesn't want us to ignore him and just go, well, I don't really want to come to you. He's like, he wants a relationship with us, and that's one of the ways that he gets to do that. The, the, you notice how it begins. It says, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. This is, this is a point of saying, 
God, you are in heaven. You created all this. And it reminds us that this isn't just our, 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 our daddy. He is that, but he's more than that. He's the guy who created this whole earth. He's the one that created this whole universe. That's who you're praying to. This is the God who can do anything and all things and your life. And if you know that, you can ask him for anything, right? If you don't really believe that he has the power to heal and to save, why would you pray to him? And we're going to see a little bit later when we, when we get to Elijah, we're going to see some cool things that God does through Elijah. But moving on, um, the other part of this that's loaded is God's going to forgive our sins, but only on one condition. We got to, we got to, we got to be forgive. We got to forgive those that wrong us. In fact, further on in uh, chapter 18 of, of this same gospel of Matthew, Jesus will say, give a, he'll give a parable of a king. And the king says, um, this guy owes him a lot of money. In fact, he owes him the equivalent of 150,000 years of service. Does that sound like a lot? Like, who could ever pay that? You'd have to live forever to just try to pay that back. Well, the guy who owes this king all of this money begs him and pleads with him and says, please, please, can you forgive this, this debt? And he says, okay, I will. And that, and that slave who got forgiven that great big debt then goes to somebody who owes him uh, three months wages and says, give me my money. What? And Jesus does this to tell us because that, that wicked slave, the one that got forgiven all that huge debt, then he goes after his fellow, his fellow slave and asks him over just something super small. God said, there's bad things for that, tormenting for that guy because he threw him into prison. He said, I'm not forgiving you. Guys, Jesus paid for a debt that we could never pay ourselves. That 150,000 years, you could give us, each of us could have that, and we'd never be able to pay back because we're not capable of paying for our sin like Jesus did. He was the only one that was perfect, lived a perfect life, died and was resurrected. He's the only way. And Jesus, if you remember, said, I am the way, the truth, the life. And nobody gets to the Father but through me. And some people get uptight about it. They're like, well, that's not fair. Well, at least there is a way, Right? At least, but the point is, we have to be forgiving to our fellow brothers and sisters. If they wrong us, in fact, Jesus, somebody, asked, one of his, uh, his disciples said, how many times do we forgive them? It's up to seven? He said, no, 70 times seven. In other words, without end. That sounds a little wrong, doesn't it? It's like we get, well, on, on, for earthly terms, like, they, 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 that's the second time they've lied to me. How many times am, they, am I supposed to let them, let them uh, forgive them of that? Well, how many times has Jesus forgiven us for our sins? Without count. I can't count the number of times I've sinned. I'm not going to tell you. Well, actually, we're, I will. Uh, we're going to get to that in just a minute. Um, so th we, we actually have to have an attitude of forgiveness towards one another. God gave us, forgave us that big debt to each of us if we accept that free gift. It wasn't, by the way, free to God. And I can tell you, having my own son now, I wouldn't give him up for you guys. No offense, but that's, but now I bet, now I was, I was trying to understand what, 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 what it was like, but until you have a kid, you don't know what it's like to, to sacrifice your own kid to save a life. I do now, and uh, it makes me appreciate even more the sacrifice God made so that I could be with him in heaven. Now, um, I want to, let's turn over to um, James, James 5. Remember, this is written by the brother, uh, Jesus' half-brother, half stepbrother. Um, and he, this is kind of, a, if you ever read James, it's, the, it's kind of a practical Christianity. You know, rubber meets the road. How, well, how do you do this? And we're going to read in um, uh, James 5, chapter 13. It says, if anyone, is anyone among you suffering? Then he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? He is to sing praises. If anyone among you is anyone among you sick, then he must call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick. 
And the Lord will raise him up if he has committed sins, and they will be forgiven him. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you will be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Then he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. That little part right there, um, well, first of all, that kind of is a continuation of what we were just talking about with that forgiveness of sins. We want to, we're, we're a community of sinners saved by grace alone, not by our works, and we're supposed to encourage one another. We're supposed to pray for one another. We're supposed to be forgiving one another. And that whole, you'll see that throughout. In fact, uh, Jesus, someone asked Jesus, what's the, what the, what's, the, what's the greatest commandment? Remember, there are two things. And Jesus said that they sum up the entire law, all of the Ten Commandments and all of the, all of the small little details, the, the different laws and rules that the, that the um, Jewish people were supposed to, to um, perform, they all boil down to two things. Love, Je- love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. And what? Love your neighbor as yourself. If you do those two things, you fulfill the law. It comes naturally. That's why we're under the law of grace. We're not under uh, judgment anymore. Once we, once we accept that gift of Jesus, that's it. That's, now we get to dwell in that love that he has for us, and we get to share that love. We get to help each other out. You're sick, or you're in sin. And I don't, so many Christians are quick to judge. Are we allowed to do that, by the way? Nope. We get to judge one person. Who is that? Numero uno, which is small. <laughs> yeah. we, we don't get to judge other people. In fact, we're supposed to help each other out of sin. This is, uh, Pastor Izzy always calls this a spiritual hospital. But this is a mass unit. A mobile, mobile, mobile uh, army, spiritual army, uh, spiritual hospital. We're supposed to come here to get healing and to, be, and to be restored. We're not here to grab stones and throw one another. Remember when Jesus was caught, or, or, or Jesus, the woman was caught in adultery, and, and, and they were ready, to, they were ready to, to stone her to death, which was permitted by the law, but Jesus said, okay, all of you guys who haven't sinned, you can throw the first stone. And one by one, they start walking away, and they're left with, and Jesus is there with the woman. And then, what's he do? He has a spirit of forgiveness and for love, and she gets restored. She doesn't get executed. And that's the kind of love that we're supposed to have. Now, the other thing that we just read through was about Elijah, right? That he prayed there would be no rain for three and a half years, and there, and there wouldn't be. That's, that that kind of reads like there was a, game, a football game last weekend, and the New England Patriots lost to the Philadelphia Eagles. The end. What? That was a game, right? That was like a you know legendary quarterback trying to make a last second drive, and at the last the last end of the game, they get he, you know the Eagles the Eagles knock the ball out of his hands, and the game is over. The Eagles upset the the Patriots. That this is kind of what we're talking about with Elijah. So now let's go to um, First Kings. So. What, this, is, this, by the way, takes place about 874 years um, before Christ. So the, the, reign, of, of, um, the reign of Ahab, uh, King Ahab, who is king of, of Israel, this is, uh, he reigned for 22 years, so this is around 874 to 853. Um, anybody know if he was a good king or a bad king? He was a wicked king. In fact, uh, it declares, the Bible declares that he was, there wasn't anybody before him that was as wicked as, a, as far as king to this guy. And on top of being a bad king and leading Israel away from God, he married Jezebel. Well, there's a piece of work. I would not recommend you ever name your kid Jezebel. Sorry if anybody here is named Jezebel. No offense, but it is not a good name. Um, and she had 850 prophets that she personally paid for to keep them, they were false prophets, of Baal and Asherah that she fed from her table. And these guys were, these guys, well, we'll see as we get into this here. So, first of all, Elijah meets with the king, and by the word of the God, he says, there's not going to be any rain on the earth until I say so. And that's going to be when the Lord tells me to say so. And the first place that Elijah goes, um, 
is to an area um, east, of the, uh, east of the Jordan River, and he is fed by ravens. Um, they bring meat and they bring bread twice a day. Talk about air delivery service. Anybody been fed by ravens before? You think that's a miracle? And then he's drinking out of the brook. Now, I don't know if I'd want to eat from the ravens, but I suppose if you're hungry enough. And th so the whole point is there, there's no rain. What happens when there's no rain? Well, brooks dry up. The food starts to go down. There's famines. Things aren't real good. So until the brook draw, uh, dries up that he's getting his water from, he's staying there. And then, interesting, the next miracle, the Lord sends him up to Sidon uh, in the kind, of the kind of north of Israel up on the Mediterranean to a Gentile widow to take care of him. Well, they didn't have social security and, and government aid at that time. If you were a widow, you were in trouble. You didn't have anybody to provide for you. So, and I mean, he's, um, Elijah is a Jew. Jews weren't supposed to have any, any dealings with Gentiles, in the, but yet the Lord sends him up to a widow in Sidon. And then um, he meets her at this gate. There's, there's, um, she's gathering sticks. Why? Because she's going to have her last dinner. Her food supply has run out. She and her son are out of food. And so he's like, oh, can you feed me? Can you give me water? Does that, that seem kind of fair? I mean, she doesn't have anything, right? But he challenges her. He says, he says first bring me water and bring me, and make, make something food for me. And then, and, then, and, then, and then you'll have a supply that won't run out. Ooh, that's a... I guess that you're, you know, if you're from her standpoint, if you're running out of food anyway, what do you have to lose? Maybe, maybe this God, it's not her God, will come through. Well, she does, she does trust him, and the God, God does uh, provide for her. In fact, he, it doesn't, her oil and her flour doesn't run out until the until this famine is over. That's miracle number two. Now I'm going to read you miracle number three because it's pretty cool. Uh, let's see here. This is um, 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 17. Now it came about that after these things, so th this, by the way, is going to be the same woman, the widow. Now it came about after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became sick. And, and his sickness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. In other words, he was dead. So he said to Elijah, What do I have to do with you, O man of God? Have you come to me to bring my sins to remembrance and put my son to death? He said to her, give me your son. Then he took him from her bosom and carried him up to the upper room where he was living and laid him on his own bed. He called to the Lord and said, O Lord my God, have you also brought calamity to this widow with whom I am saying by causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and called to the Lord and said, O oh Lord my God, I pray you, let this child's life return to him. The Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the life of the child returned to him, and he revived. Elijah took the child and brought him down to the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son is alive. Now catch this. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. Wait a minute. Didn't she just have an endless supply of food? There was going to be oil that wouldn't run out. There was going to be flour that didn't run out. They would have starved to death. But she didn't really notice that. She said, she, it doesn't say that she believed then. It says that she believed after her son was raised from the dead. Isn't it nice to know that we have a God that has power over death? And never forget that because when we face, we're faced with life and death and we had that ballistic missile threat and we didn't know that it was a mistake. I didn't anyway. I'm like, this could be the end. Who am I going to turn to? My God. My God is an awesome God. I'm going to turn to him. What, as Peter said, who else do you turn to? You got nothing. No other gods are, no, all the other gods are false. They're not going to do us any good. In fact, we're going to see that now as we continue. So, Elijah's now had these miracles to kind of help provide for him during this time. Well, now the drought is, is, is maybe nearing completion. The Lord says, okay, now I want you to go see the king, king Ahab, and we're going we're gonna to have a duel, and then I'm going to bring rain. And so um, 
This is in um, chapter 18, verse 17. And this is Elijah challenging King Ahab. And he says, When King Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is this you, you troubler of Israel? He said, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, because you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and have followed the Baals. Now then, send and gather to me all Israel at Mount Carmel, together with the 450, these are the false prophets of Baal, and 400 prophets of Asherah, who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent a message among all the sons of Israel and brought the prophets together at Mark, Mar Mount Carmel. Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people did not answer him a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Now let, that, now let them give us two oxen and let them choose one ox. So he gives them the first choice for themselves and cut it up and place it on the wood and put no fire under it. And I will prepare the other ox and lay it on wood and I will not put fire under it. Then you call on the name of your God and I will call on the name of the Lord and the God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the people said, that is a good idea. So Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one ox for yourselves and prepare it first so you, so, uh, for you are many and call on the name of your God, but put no fire under it. Then they took the ox which was given them and prepared it and called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice and no one answered. And they leaped about the altar which they made. It came about at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Call out with a loud voice, for he is a god. Either he is occupied, which actually means like he's in the bath, going to the bathroom, or gone aside, or maybe on a journey, or maybe he's just asleep and needs to be wakened. So they cried with a loud voice and cut themselves according to their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out on them. When midday was past, they raved until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. This was the first rave concert, by the way. But there was no voice, no one answered, and no one paid attention. Then Elijah said to the people, come near me. So all the people came to him. He, rep he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down previously. Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. So with the stones, he built the altar in the name of the Lord, he made a trench around the altar, large enough to hold two measures of seed. Then he arranged the wood and cut the ox in pieces and laid it on the wood. And he said, fill four pitchers of water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. Now remember, this is a drought. So they gotta, they're, they, water is valuable right now. And he's saying, let's go get some pitchers and pour it. Let's soak the wood. By the way, did they do that for, this, for, the, for the, the bales? No. They just, they, he didn't add water. It was just, just dry. They still couldn't get it to work. But he's adding water. He's four, four pitchers first. Then he said, do it a second time. So they did it a second time. They said, do it a third time. So now you're talking about 12 pitchers of water, enough to soak the sacrifice at the ox, and also to create a moat of water around it. You think, we, you think, we're, you think we're dry? No, I think we're pretty soaked right now. The water flowed around the altar and was filled, to, filled the trench with water. At the time of the, e of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, today let it be known that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and I have done all le these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know, catch this, you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering, and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces. They said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And by the way, the guy who God used to bring this all to pass, Elijah, you know what his name means? My God is the Lord. Fitting, huh? Then Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. 
So they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. So 850 of these false prophets get executed that day. And then he's going to pray seven times, and the Lord is going to bring rain, the rain that, so now three and a half years later. Now, you might look at Elijah, and you go, well, that's Elijah. But I'm telling you, Elijah was flawed too. So imagine after all the miracles that he's, that he's been through, right? It's like fed by the ravens, um, fed, you know, fed by a widow, uh, raised a widow's son who died, and, and now there's this, this big standoff on the, on the top of Mark Carme Mount Carmel. And then right after this, he's freaked out because Jezebel's going to come after his head. He's just killed her, her prophets, and she's coming after him, and he freaks out, and he runs for his life. Does that sound like he may be having a bad faith day? <laughs> maybe a little worn out? And maybe you've had that too. That's okay. You just have to remember that when the chips are down, you just got to remember who to turn to. And just remember, God is the Lord. There aren't others. You can have another one, but it's not going to do anything. It's going to have the same effect as it did for these false prophets. They're false. They're not the real deal. Okay, now I want to go back to um, James. I lost it. There it is. This is uh, just after we were, ta we were talking about that he prayed and the rain, and the rain came. And this is the end of, the end of James, um, chapter 19 and 20. My brethren, if any among you strays from the truth and one turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the errors of his way will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. In all of this prayer that we're talking about, God's goal is to restore you and to heal you. That's what he did with the people. He let them go through that drought and that famine because they had turned to false gods. And then he used that moment on the top of Mount Carmel to have a real showing of God's power. Why? Not to just wow and dazzle them, but to, for them to rem be reminded that this God, this God in heaven, he's the real deal. That's who you want to put your faith in. And that everybody, every other God is, is not going to deliver. It's going to be, there's going to be no fire that goes up. So when we pray, remember the God you serve and remember what they can do for you. That he's the one that, he's the one that's only one that's going to be able to answer the prayer. And sometimes when you ask him for things, he knows better. But one of the things about answered prayer is great things happen, especially when you're praying for others. And we're, you know, we just, in that, in that model prayer, we we're supposed to come to God how often to pray for, pray for supply every day. But the Bible also tells us we're supposed to pray without ceasing. That means that we're supposed to pray throughout the day. I don't know about you, but I get distracted. I squirrel a lot, and I forget to pray. But we need to be reminded about the power of prayer, just like the power that Elijah had and the power that the disciples had when they got raised from the dead. That was, that was real power, and it's still available. That wasn't just then. God used those things then to encourage us now so that we have it with us as we go through our day and through our week, as we face challenges, as we face life and death situations, and what we, when we face our eternal consequences, we, we, there's only one way. But thank God we have a way. We just have to take that gift and follow it. And by the way, don't be stingy. Share it with others. Now, um, where's our kids at? Um, hey, Alex, Harrison, Marissa. <whistles> All right. This is, so uh, while they're coming over, um, I just want to, these, these kids, I, I had the privilege to, um, for the last year and a half or so, um, teach Sunday school with them. And they're, they're great kids. They find, I know sometimes you guys get kind of old and you get a little stuck in your ways and you don't always absorb. Kids are young and they're like, yes. I know this. Um, we, I've been. I started praying for them that they would that they would make that decision to follow Christ when we when I first started teaching Sunday school, and and in the last in the last month, three have made the decision to take make Jesus their Lord and their Savior, and they know what it means. But we wanna we wanna pray over them this morning that that as a body of believers, remember we're supposed to pray for one another, we're supposed to encourage one another. 
we're going to do that with them. And we're also going to, um, speaking of answered prayer, I'm going to dedicate my son. Um, you know, we, I prayed for a long time for him. And uh, I, I wanted him earlier. I didn't know, actually know if it was going to be a son or a daughter. But I, I prayed for a long time. The Lord said, you're not ready yet. And everybody says there's no good time to have a kid. I understand that. But I also think the Lord knew that there was a better time for me and for my family and for John. And, man, he was worth waiting for, let me tell you. He's this awesome little guy. And I don't know, I don't know other babies, so I have no real comparison. But he wakes up with a smile on his face. He woke up laughing this morning. And I was like, oh, you're so awesome. Such joy. And, I mean, he's, like, giggling. And he's, like, got a smile. And it's just kind of stuff that just melts your, melt your, uh, melt your heart. So, um, so I'm going to have him come up with my wife, Beth, and um, I just give God the glory because uh, short of the Lord, you know, I, we never would have had him. It was, it was, uh, it was his, he's my little miracle boy. And remember, no touch. <laughs> just kidding. Well, not kidding. But, uh, and then anybody that wants to come up, uh, stand behind us. As we, uh, we're going we're gonna to pray over him right now. And I want to have, um, have the three kids come up, Alex and Harrison and Marissa. We're going to pray over them as well. And I'm just excited to be here, excited to celebrate uh, this life. Um, and his name, by the way, is named after John the Baptist. It means God is gracious. And God has been very gracious to us. All right, first I'm going to pray over my son. Uh, Father, uh, I'm going to try to hold back the tears, but... Um, you have been so awesome to me and to, and to my wife. Lord, we thank you for this boy. And we thank you, um, though he came late, Lord, he was worth the wait. And Lord, we just pray now that you would, you would um, use him mightily to spread the gospel, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you would um, let him be encouraged by this body of believers around us, Lord. We pray that you would let him be a ch- have, lead a changed life full of the Holy Spirit, and that from a young age, Lord, he would know you as the God and Jesus as the way and the truth and the life. And Lord, I also pray for these, uh, these three young believers, Lord, that have made commitments to follow you. Lord, for Alex uh, and Harrison and Marissa, Lord, I thank you for that decision to make you not just their Savior, but you made, you made Jesus, they made Jesus your, their Lord and their Savior. And, Lord, I pray that you would encourage them. Lord, teach us all to be prayer warriors, Lord, to to seek you every day and throughout the day and to pray for others, Lord, and to give us a heart of love towards one another. And, Lord, to to these guys that have made that uh, commitment, Lord, we pray that you would add to their faith goodness and to their goodness, knowledge, and to their knowledge, self-control, and to their self-control, perseverance. And, Lord, to their perseverance, godliness and to their godliness brotherly kindness and to their brotherly kindness love and lord we pray that as you do this lord you will bear fruit in their life we pray now that you would lead us and guide us lord we thank you for this time in your word we give you glory and honor in jesus name and all god's people said amen Amen. all right guys go in the strength of the lord thank you for this time thank you for celebrating this special day with me Amen. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo, and God bless.